We're getting a late start today because the four of us just spent 90 minutes in the only face-to-face meeting of Governor Mike DeWine and his challenger, Nan Whaley, face-to-face over teams. It's one of the things we'll be talking about on Today in Ohio, the news podcast discussion from Cleveland.com and The Plain Dealer. I'm Chris Quinn. I am here with Layla Tassi, Lisa Garvin, and Laura Johnston. And let's just start. We just spent 90 minutes that got a little heated at times about abortion and about guns. What were your reflections? Lisa, you go first. Yeah, I felt like, yeah, um, and we've known all along that Governor Mike DeWine is pro-life, and he he emphasized that. He said protection of life is part of his leadership all along. He did say there were good people on both sides of the issue. And he said the legislature will take up a permanent ban very soon. So I'm thinking that might happen in the lame duck session and probably will. Um, he says, you know, the Ohio, Ohio has the right to referendum. He said that the legislature should consider that. And he says that there will be clarity in whatever bill is passed for doctors and providers to follow. So they don't have to send a 10 year old, you know, to Indiana. And of course, Nan Whaley immediately jumped on that saying, you know, this 10 year old had to leave because the law was so vague and doctors were afraid to treat her here in the state. And uh, she said, this is affecting medical students and doctors. They're either coming here for education and then going somewhere else, or we're not attracting doctors and, and medical people to the state because of our abortion stance. Yeah, can I jump I, in? I, yeah, he, go ahead. You know, he was saying that, uh, yeah, whatever bill comes his way, it must be, it must have clarity and, it, and uh, you know, that it, it has to inform doctors and that sort of thing. But the heartbeat bill was very unclear and he signed mm-hmm. it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I well, felt like that was a little bit of a, you know, I don't know, that, that yeah. rubbed me the wrong way. There were two little caveats in there. One, he said that because we have the referendum, the legislature ought to take heed. Almost saying the legislature ought to water this down to prevent it from going to That's referendum. That's exactly what he was saying. But but there, there's no way this isn't going to referendum. I mean, the majority of Ohioans believe in a Roe v. Wade status. And if the if the legislature doesn't do that, then we're, we'll go to referendum. Oh, but he was the, totally saying that the, that the legislature should water it down so that it, because he used the word sustainable. He wants it to be sustainable so that it wouldn't provoke a referendum, yeah, but, basically. But we've talked about this over and over. There's no middle ground here. Either you're going to restrict abortion severely or you're not. So I, I think that was folly. Him saying that was words. The other thing he seemed to say, although I don't think he ever said it outright, is in the case of the 10-year-old who was raped, she should be able to get an abortion. He said, I believe she could have gotten one in Ohio. And if that's not the case, we need to figure it out. But he seemed to say that if a 10 year old's raped, his beliefs don't don't mean that baby should be carried to full term. Did I did I misinterpret that? I mean, I took it. Uh, That is how I took it. But I think it took him a little bit of pushing to get there because he doesn't want to be pinned down. He just wants to be like, I believe in the sanctity of life. And he focused on rape victims, right? He said, there's no one that's done more in Ohio to protect va- rape victims than I have. And it's like, that's not what we're really talking about. Yeah, right I mean, He did that with the gun issue. He did yeah. that a number of times. And the thing he's expert at, and we've seen him a number of times, is talking for a long time so that his opponent gets less of the fewer of the minutes to talk. <laughs> Although, let's face it, Nan Willie gave as good as, as she got. She she went right at him uh, and and was very incisive in the way she was hitting him. She actually did very, very well. We talked at the end about uh, that, that if you were rating this as a debate, there were some that thought she would be the winner of the debate because of the way she was holding him to account. Sadly, this is the only face-to-face meeting, right? There's no debate. Mike DeWine would not debate her. So we will put this video up once we produce it. Sadly, both of them seem to have some sound issues. So <laughs> I don't know if we'll be able to clean those out. Well, I, I, I really think you're right, though. He he talked, Mike DeWine talked a lot. And I was surprised how much he talked about the pandemic and the science and, and how he reopened schools. And I was like, is that what people are voting on right now? Because I don't think that's in the forefront. People are thinking about the future, about abortion, about inflation, about guns, you know, at, not what he did two and a half, three years Actually, ago. Actually, Laura, I hear from a whole lot of people, Democrats and uh, claiming to be Democrats and Republicans, who still are talking about his leadership 
particularly in the beginning of the pandemic. I think there are some Democrats that are going to vote for him because they felt like he provided leadership. He was a national figure there for a while. And, and I know, got, and then he kind of backed off when the legislature was going to, you know, try to crush him. Well, Nan Whaley pointed out that, that that as he got deeper into his term, he was kowtowing to the far right fringe element of his party. And we've talked about that repeatedly. He was handcuffed by a super majority of those mm-hmm. folks in the in the legislature. Lisa, I think you talked a little bit about that at the mm-hmm. end, right? I did. Yeah. And that, you know, because we have seen he was a very, um, you know, kind of middle of the road centrist Republican. People looked up to him, a bit, but the party started to turn against him, as we know, co- COVID mask mandates and closures became a political hot potato for the right. And so I feel like he was trying to keep his job and maybe going along. But I think when it comes to redistricting, though, that was a complete failure on his part. And as as far as and Keith Faber and Frank LaRose, I mean, they just let Huffman and Cup take over. Yeah, although I did think DeWine did a halfway decent job of articulating the conflicts and the constitutional amendment and what the court was saying about the, the having competitive districts and having compact districts mm-hmm. might be mutually exclusive. Layla, you, you felt at the end that, that the governor was unsatisfactory in explaining some of the issues that you thought were key. Yeah, I mean, p- particularly I had asked him about House Bill 126, and that was the the uh, the bill that limits the ability of school districts to challenge undervalued properties at county boards of revision. And didn't you feel like he just kind of blew off that question? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, he we... signed that bill, and that that puts all of us on the hook for for the right. you know whatever taxes need to be made up. And we right. railed against that as a an, as an editorial board. Yeah, and so. Was in a... What's his defense of that? He was just right. like, what? And Nanny <laughs> Whaley immediately <laughs> jumped on that. She says, so you just signed something that wasn't as bad as it could have been. I thought that was that's funny. Yeah, Right. That's exactly what she said. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, we will get this put on our site as soon as we can. It probably take the bulk of today, but people will be able to, to see them go at it. it. It's a good format. Check it out later. You're listening to Today in Ohio. Look, let's forget about Mike DeWine and Nan Whaley. Where the heck have John Houston and Cheryl Stevens been? They're on the ballot with DeWine and Whaley as the candidates for lieutenant governor. Lisa, we've heard almost nothing from them. How come? Well, they just haven't been highly visible on the campaign trail until recently. I think it's probably all hands on deck with the election looming. But, uh, you know, they're usually separate from the governor. You know, they... um, This is interesting because in Texas, we elect the lieutenant governor separately. They're not on the ticket with the governor. I guess we're one, uh, Texas was one of 17 states to do that. But anyway, um, this allows incumbent governors their lieutenant governor to spread the campaign message efficiently. It's like two, you know, two heads are better than one. And Husted's incumbency gives him an advantage on the campaign trail because he can appear in his official capacity and garner media coverage for that and then make, you know, election statements or campaign statements. He's attended several events in the last week in about 12 counties from Cuyahoga to Butler County. And that will help him if he runs for governor in the future. And his challenger, Cheryl Stevens, is at a disadvantage because she's not in office, but she has traveled extensively recently to meet Democratic candidates and volunteers, uh, Delaware, Butler, Allen counties, and she's appeared at abortion rights rallies as well. So Ohio Democratic Chair Chris Redfern says that he's very impressed with the recent events in, in Columbus and Toledo that Stevens has done. And he says she's getting a positive response from black voters in Cincinnati, Dayton, and Cuyahoga counties. But yeah, um, interestingly enough, though, the University of Cincinnati poli sci professor David Niven says it seemed like Cheryl Stevens was in witness protection. You know, they, 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 she didn't seem very visible, although her campaign <laughs> disagrees. Well, I, you know, I can posit a reason for that. I mean, she's a member of the Cuyahoga County Council, which we've pretty much demonstrated are a bunch of bobbleheads. And so <laughs> if you put her out there in a big way, it gives the DeWine campaign something to go hard at. I mean, these are people that have squandered millions of dollars on slush funds and the MedMart. And, you know, we're ready to to move toward a toxic site for the jail. So I, 
I'm not surprised that she's not very visible because there's a lot of baggage there. It is it is just a strange political season. Of course, you know, you really haven't seen a lot of Nan Whaley herself mm-hmm. because she hasn't had that much money. She's been incredibly hamstrung by a lack of funding, whereas the incumbent has a ton of cash. So interesting. You're listening to Today in Ohio. We've never not passed a tax for the Cleveland Metro Parks, but all the worries people have about inflation, some are worrying about whether the tax that the parks rely on for most of its operating fund will not pass. It expires in a year. Pete Krauss t- took a look at what it might mean if they lose it. Laura, what did he find? Yeah, I had no idea how big of a piece of the budget this is. It's nearly 60% of the revenue for the Metro Parks, which has a budget of about $137 million in 2023. And like you said, it is funded through 2023. So this levy would replace that. That's what's on the ballot. And it would cost about $95 a year for a $100,000 home. That's about $27 more than what taxpayers are currently paying. So it is an increase. And the Metro Parks haven't laid out exactly what would be cut if this doesn't pass, because I think they would go back again and ask voters. But there are so many things that they're doing. And, you know, we talk about them all the time, things like Edgewater, the trails projects, and they just wouldn't be able to do anything more. And then they'd have a hard time maintaining what they do have. And the reason they can do some of these really big projects is they leverage their money to get other grants so that, larger federal and and government grants are paying for a lot of the work, like $16.5 million on a Tiger Trails project. That included that Wendy Park Bridge, if you biked over that, the Red Line Greenway, Whiskey Island Trail, a whole lot of things. But yeah, they're very visible, obviously, in the communities, and we're not exactly sure what would be cut. Yeah, but it's it, when you talk about their operating fund, anybody that's walked down a trail and seen a tree that had fallen there and been cut apart, that's operating money. That's mm-hmm. it's the clearing the roads with, of snow. It's operating money. It's the police force they run. That's operating money. And if they if they don't get this money, they will have to severely curtail a lot of the work that their staff is doing in the parks. And you're right. I I quite hadn't quite realized it either. It turns out that the Metro parks have to always have a 10 year sunset on this tax. It's in the state law. So, so it falls off a cliff. If they don't get people to vote every 10 years to renew this tax, they lose all their money. And so normally you would think there's no way this could not pass. Everybody loves their parks, but, but because of inflationary fears, there are a lot of polls showing people are going to the polls and just voting no on all taxes. Uh, so we did this story to show what that means because people do love their parks. Yeah. And I think if you think it's an increase, well, they'll be like, well, they can just live with what they've got. But that's not the case in this. This would just be like eliminating all of the money for the metro parks, which I had no idea. Created in 1917, they grew from three acres in what's now the Rocky River Reservation, 25,000 acres across 49 communities. That includes 18 reservations, eight golf courses, and the zoo. I mean, that's a lot. You're listening to Today in Ohio. So, Layla, we talked last week about how Mayor Justin Bibb had had not had any big ideas and had kind of fallen flat on his face with his idea to expunge records. I I don't know if it's the podcast that did it, but something (laughs) has sparked him because he's doing all sorts of stuff suddenly. He wants to make a bigger investment in making sure mental health breakdowns are not escalated by police. What is his proposal? He's he's proposing a, a greater investment in the city's crisis intervention team, which sends specially trained officers and mental health professionals to calls where someone is having a mental health crisis. And the goal is to reduce arrests and uses of force for people who are in that situation. The city's been piloting this program using one officer and one licensed clinician for each of the city's five police districts. But Justin Bibb wants to use $5 million in American Rescue Plan Act funding to double the size of that team for five years. The increased staff would would allow crisis intervention teams to be available for an extra shift. So this money will pay for salaries for 10 licensed social workers. It'll pay for the salary for three years for a public safety mental health strategist and the salary for a specially trained mental health dispatcher, and then also 10 unmarked vehicles. They still they still have to figure out the best deployment strategy, whether that means sending social workers out with police or sending them out on their own or a combination of those strategies. But the pilot seems to have proven successful. So Bib is really trying to build upon that success. 
It's fascinating to me how mental health has just risen so high in the public consciousness. It was a big part of what Mike DeWine was talking about in our endorsement interview. The pandemic really has brought out the need for more mental health help. And this is another example with all of the times police have gone into a situation Mm -hmm. and actually made it worse when it involved mental health. This is a way to combat that. It's a great conversation and it's good to see the mayor committing some real resources to it. Yeah. And the police chief has really celebrated the, you know, when he was at the committee uh, table the other day, he celebrated the the outcome of this pilot. He said that, uh, you know, they've received 3,400 referrals to the crisis intervention team. And of those, just under 900 were linked with mental health services and calls where the crisis intervention team was involved had lower rates of people being taken to the emergency room. Fewer people were placed in handcuffs and arrest rates were lower. So that data speaks for itself. Yeah, it's a good news story. It's today in Ohio. Parker Hannafin is one of the bigs when it comes to corporate presence in Cleveland, and it's getting a new CEO. Lisa, who's stepping down and who is stepping up? Yeah, the CEO of this Mayfield Heights-based uh, com- company um, with 58,000 employees across 50 countries and 300 manufacturing facilities, CEO Thomas Williams is retiring at the end of 2023. Well, he's retiring, but he's going to stay on as executive chairman um, f- until 2023. And so taking his place will be uh, the current chief operating officer, Jennifer Parmentier. She will become the new CEO as of January 1st. She's been with Parker Hannafin since 2008, and she became the COO in 2021. And moving up to take her place as COO is Andrew Ross, who is the head currently of Parker Hannafin's Fluid Connectors Group. So, and, and you know, everyone had good things to say about Williams and, and, uh, uh, you know, he was CEO for seven years, did a lot with the company. They make motion and control technology for aeronautics and airspace and, and manufacturing. So they're, you know, they're a big dog and they, and they had good leadership. Okay. You're listening to Today in Ohio. Part two of Justin Bibb's flurry of activity. Laura, what did he announce about developing the lakefront yesterday? The public can finally weigh in on these ideas. So we are talking about six public listening sessions. They start Thursday, November 3rd, 5.30 p.m. at City Hall Rotunda. And the focus is on this North Coast connector, the bridge over from the downtown mall linking downtown to the lakefront over the shoreway and the railroad tracks to create this pedestrian-friendly link. So this is actually the first public meeting since about this, since Jimmy and Dee Haslam, the Browns owners, unveiled their concept in May 2021. So we've been talking a lot about it since then, but there hasn't been a public forum. So Mayor Bibb's going to be at this meeting. He's going to share his vision, and they want to gather responses to four hypothetical alternatives on the day ta- downtown lakefront and then ask general questions about how often people visit, how they get there, what the experience is like. Well, if history is a guide, a lot of people will attend. When Jane Campbell did this as mayor, hundreds and hundreds of people wanted to weigh in. So many people care about the lakefront. It might even be bigger now because there's so many more activities. It is interesting that he said He's going to offer his vision first, Mm -hmm. which you would think, well, wait, if it's a hearing to find out what people think. But it sounds like what he's really doing is offering the framework of the discussion. It it sounds like it. And then this is going to be a series and they're not all going to be at City Hall. They're going all over the city. Zelma George Recreation Center, Collinwood, St. Joseph Academy, Estabrook Recreation Center and Church of Christ at the Boulevard on St. Clair. So they are going to be taking this tour a little bit on the road. They have a website that they launched to collect information and kind of put their own vision out there. That's Cleveland North Coast dot com, which I did not know existed. So, yeah, I mean, they've they've they're asking for people's opinions. Obviously, they're doing other work. They've got um, a study that ODOT is doing right now with the city on the impact of regional traffic patterns of the Haslam plan. And then there's a new 500,000 master planning process for the downtown lakefront that's going to be of a larger area than just the Haslam proposal. So they are gathering information, trying to figure this out. Also a consultant exploring about closing Burke. All right. Well, let's make sure he doesn't say he's the first to take this thing on the road because Jane Campbell did exactly the same thing. He's following her blueprint, but maybe he won't cave like she did on shutting down Burke. It's today in Ohio. 
Cleveland City Council did something that I don't think I saw even once when I covered it. Layla, <laughs> maybe you saw it when you covered it. It rejected legislation that was brought to the floor. Usually, if the votes aren't there, it doesn't reach the floor. What's this one about and what's the next step? Yes, this is the Haley's Comet of legislative activity, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. I mean, city council never, ever, ever brings legislation to the floor for a vote unless it's clearly going to pass. But this piece somehow made it through the gauntlet of the finance committee meeting Monday afternoon, only to get taken down by this cascade of no votes at the full committee meeting or the full uh, council meeting Monday night. So the legislation is a proposal from Earl Turner, the clerk of the Cleveland Municipal Court. His request was for a one-year $234,000 agreement with Nash West LLC for a single Nash West employee to continue serving as the clerk's point person on the implementation of the Odyssey system. This is the Municipal Court's new case management software. Setting up this system as a replacement for the court's prior court view software has been a three and a half million dollar plus endeavor. It's been years in the making. It's faced delays due to the pandemic. And this system manages and disseminates information for all criminal, civil and traffic cases in Cleveland Muni Court. IT has been plagued with problems (laughs) since this went live back in April. So Nash West was hired in 2019 to oversee the clerk's office's portion of this project. And this one employee has served as the clerk's project manager, overseeing implementation and analysis and training on the new software for clerk of court's employees and how to mold the office's business practices to accommodate the new system. And Turner says he still needs this assistant. So council didn't buy it. They thought he didn't make the case for both the need for this contract and the cost of it. It's a lot of money for a single project manager. So they debated this for more than an hour at the finance committee Monday, and yet it passed through to the floor vote. And at first, three council members, Charles Slife, Kerry McCormick, and Brian Casey voted no. And that set off this chain reaction where nine ended up in total rejecting this. And then there's this weird twist because this legislation is headed back to city council's agenda (laughs) because council lawyers have informed them that because this expenditure is within the parameters of Earl Turner's council approved budget, he could technically sue council for denying it. He's not saying he's going to do that. He says he thinks he and council will work it out. But some members of council aren't too happy about this development because they're feeling a little strong-armed into supporting something that doesn't make sense to them. Although the the courts and the prosecutor's office and things like that have always had the ability to go to a higher power if they don't like what their budget is, what's happening with their budget. They're elected officials and they're supposed to be able to run their office, but there's the, the legislative body sets their budget. And we've seen examples of that over time. That threat, though, because we're talking about 150k here. No, we're really talking about should... more than that. It's oh, how much 234. Is it? Oh, 234. It's still a not a, not a huge amount of money. I I I think it's a surprise that the city council is ready to cave so quickly under the threat of a lawsuit. If they really believe that this is inappropriate expenditure, to to immediately say, "Oh, he can sue us. Let's go back." Instead of saying, hey, you know, go ahead, threaten your lawsuit or come and talk to us some more because you have not explained this satisfactorily. But I, I just was surprised at how who's responsible for caving. Is this the council president? Yeah, Blaine I mean, Griffin? Blaine Griffin, you know, sent out a memo to everybody with some bullet points on why they need to reconsider it. And he made all the and he and one of them was that he his researchers vetted this company and they look legit. <laughs> And other the other arguments were the legal ones that that this is that this is an independent arm of government and they have their budget and uh, you know council can't you know do what they're doing. Um, they can do what they're doing. Well, I mean, they have an absolute right to do what they're doing. If he completely disagrees, he can sue. That doesn't mean he wins. I mean, if he goes before the higher court and he says, "This is why I need it." And the council says, no, that, that's, that's he not says, true. He says the clerk of courts and municipal court are independent government entities. It's our fiduciary responsibility to fund their budget. We do not oversee the court. And he says there are court cases that back up that argument and uh, that the judges believe this is needed for the court to do their business. 
Yeah, I don't know. Sounds like I, yeah. it'll be interesting Council to see how this are, goes. I'm telling Carrie McCormick was like, so sue me. I'm not voting right. yes. <laughs> right. So, but, I mean, they're doing we'll their see. job in oversight and they shouldn't cave just because of a threat that goes to court. If they're doing the right thing, they should present their case in court. Fascinating case. Like I said, I've never seen it. Uh, and it's good to see the city council acting is in oversight. That's what they're there for. It's today in Ohio. How do how does the Akron police chief defend keeping officers involved in the Jalen Walker killing on duty in the face of some serious public opposition? Lisa, they went public yesterday to fight back. Yeah, in a word, uh, Akron Police Department Chief Stephen Milet, you know, reinstated these eight officers to administrative duty after being on leave since the June shooting of Jalen Walker. So they're not on street patrols. They're not in, in cruisers. They're they're doing desk jobs. And this is still under investigation by the Attorney General and its Bureau of Criminal Investigation. But Milet said, in a word, he did it because of staffing shortages. I mean, eight eight officers. I don't know how many officers they have, but that's probably a good chunk of their police force. And of course, these reinstatements spurred a letter from 40 community and religious leaders demanding that the reinstatements be revoked. They said there is no justification to put them back to work in an ongoing investigation at the, and the, the staffing issues are not a good enough reason to bring them back. Milet struck back. He issued a news release on the reinstatement. He says that his staffing struggles are huge. He said he did consult with stakeholders and community leaders before proceeding. He said that, uh, you know, this decision was not made in haste and, uh, you know, he wanted to, you know, deal with the ongoing public safety challenges by putting more officers back on in in, you know, in work. But he said he was, quote, deeply disappointed and confused by this letter. He said it misrepresents the conversations about reinstatement that he had. And he added that 90 percent who signed this letter were not part of these discussions. Yeah, I just it seems like he's got a bit of a tin ear to the community. I mean, this is continues to get national attention. We still don't have all the answers or many of the answers and it's a raw point. Akron had largely dealt better with this than many cities do, but this seems a little clumsy. Well, but then again, you know, he's trying to balance public safety. So if you take eight officers off the streets, that's an impact on public safety. I, I'm, I'm just playing devil's advocate here. You know, and he said he did consult with people, but apparently not the people who wrote the letter. So he's kind of in a rock, between a rock and a hard place there. Okay. It's today in Ohio. Now that the 101-mile towpath trail is complete, communities want to link to it with branch trails. What's the latest to start construction on such a branch, Laura? This is the Ohio and Erie Canal Summit Lake Trail, and it's a really cool success story around Summit Lake. So this is a three-mile multipurpose trail. It's going to link the eastern and western neighborhoods surrounding Summit Lake in Akron, and that connects to the towpath. This area has been a huge focus for the Knight Foundation in Akron in the last few years. It was once a hub for recreation, but by the early 20th century, it was a dumping ground for factory waste. In the last couple of years, they've really poured money into it. The water quality has improved. Now you can use it for recreational activities. They've torn down some of the decaying buildings and cleaned up the shoreline, put in some art and a boat ramp. So now they'll have this really cool path to connect it to, you know, a hundred miles up and down Ohio. Yeah. Now that that's complete, I, I mean, I would think every community would want to have a tie to it because it just opens up recreational opportunities galore. So cool to see. It's today in Ohio. That's going to do it for the Thursday edition of the podcast. Thanks, Layla. Thanks, Lisa. Thanks, Laura. Look later today for a video of the governor's endorsement interview. Thanks for listening. We'll be back Friday.